I'm going to talk to you today about my work in the development of the in vitro plate-based thallium flux assay to enable identification and optimization of novel potassium channel agonists. Potassium ion channels that we are investigating are voltage-gated ion channels responsible for cell membrane potential homeostasis. It's known that uh, in the therapeutic area that we were interested in that the potassium channel dysfunction was implicated uh, in the disease state. And that's uh, also known was that modulation uh, of, of this channel was useful for therapeutic indication as well. At the start of the project, we set up some assay screening criteria. Uh, we knew that we wanted an assay that was high throughput, which meant that it had to be rapid and easy, easily prosecuted. We also wanted the data to correlate well with manual patch plan. We explored various assay formats um, that, were, that were available, and we ruled out alternative assays that had poor data correlation or assay complexity. In the end, we basically decided that we wanted to run a thallium flux assay. There are multiple thallium flux assays available in the market from different vendors. Uh, they, they, they have either a wash kit or no wash kits available. At that time, we decided to proceed with the wash version for development. And right at the onset, Catherine from Molecular Devices actually contacted me to beta test their soon-to-be-released no-wash thallium flux acid kit that was in development. I agreed to do so only if it agreed with my timelines. Very quickly, looking at the wash acid principle, it's, uh, you, you load the dye into the cell cytoplasm, you wash off the excess uh, extracellular thallium dye, and then you add the extracellular thallium. Shown here, when the ion channel is closed and you add the thallium and then thallium can't get in, you basically have no reaction with the dye. Whereas on the right side here, when the thallium can permeate the cell, it reacts with the dye, giving fluorescence. This is our final assay wash protocol. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward protocol. Uh, after plating your cells and incubating them overnight, roughly around 17 to 20 hours, when you're ready to start your assay, you remove the media from your plated cells. You dilode and you incubate for 90 minutes. Inside this dilode, there's added for benefit, and this is uh, needed because you want to block the efflux transport and make sure that you retain your dye. You remove the dye and you wash it with heat buffered HBSS. And when you're ready to start the actual measurements, you add your 20 microliters of assay buffer, you add your compound of interest, you do a pre read, and this pre read is to basically uh, identify any fluorescent compounds, and you incubate that for about 20 minutes. And when you're re finally re ready to read on the Tetra system, you add your uh, thallium. I'm not going to bore everybody with the mundane aspects of this assay, but rather focus on some of the, what we found the most interesting and key to making sure that our agonist assay worked. And this is the, the concentration of thallium and potassium is critical in making sure that your agonist assay works. Before looking at some of the critical results, I want to sh uh, show, uh, mention how I handled some of the raw data. This is a typical plate setup uh, where you have the 384 well plates designated here with our various concentrations or our various conditions rather. And right here is the window that shows the um, typical well signal output. And with these highlighted wells here, it's showing two types of cells. Our stably transfected cell line expressing the potassium channel and it's parental, non-transfected, non non-expressing, uh, not overly expressing uh, cell line. Also in here is uh, two different concentrations of opener, and this opener we're going to call opener O. And also what you see here is that when you add the two millimolar thallium, and also in this case there's actually no added potassium, and you add 80, uh, in the presence of 80 micromolar opener, you see that the potassium channel expressing hex cell shows fluorescence. When you don't add any of the opener, shown here in green, 
you basically see this baseline level of fluorescence. With the non-transfective parental cell, whether you add the 80 micromolar or zero micromolar opener, you basically see this baseline. This is to be expected. This is what we, uh, we saw. So in handling the data, after you assign your, your, your negative control in green here, you make sure you subtract that out and calculate a uh, response over baseline, which is what we, we, we did, and we expressed it as either fold or percentage over baseline. And when you do that, this is what you'll see. This is your characteristic signal trace, shown with the 80 micromolar compound and the potassium channel expressing hexane. Everything else basically looks like a flat line. And then we analyze the max minus min. So this shows the data analysis for the opener O that I spoke about previously. Shown here, there's some parental there's the parental cell line and the potassium channel expressing cell line. Four different concentrations of the opener in micromolar. On the y-axis is fold over baseline, and then the four different um, conditions having four different concentrations of potassium, 0, 2.5, 5, and 10. And what you see is that the 0 millimolar potassium gives us the best signal of the back, background window to evaluate potassium channel openers, shown here in the dark blue. Also, what you see is that the parental cells actually show very little response to the opener. And whatever response that you see is essentially just the basal level of expression of whatever potassium channels are, are there. On the other, on the other hand, the potassium channels that are expressed in this cell line respond in a various, to the various concentrations of opener. So you see this concentra concentration-dependent response. Further studies investigating the potassium effect on the assay readout showed that as you increase potassium, shown here where we basically went from 0 to 2.5 millimolar potassium, your signal to background actually decreases. And when you look at the EC50s shown on the right here, you notice that as you increase the potassium, you actually decrease the EC50 value, thus increasing the potency. From literature and from our own uh, experiments in the manual patch clamp, we knew that this compound had a EC50 roughly around 10 micromolar. Certainly with these three conditions here, we were within the, the range of expectation. In a similar study, this time varying thallium concentration from 0.5 to 4 millimolar, we saw that the 2 millimolar thallium is the concentration that gave us optimal signals of background, shown here again in green. And when you have very little potassium, such as 0.5 millimolar, you'll see a very depressed signal. So there's actually not much signal to be, to be measured. On the other hand, when you add the 4 millimolar, you see a depression in the, uh, in the signals of background. And when you look at EC50s, you'll notice that as you increase the, the amount of thallium, the EC50 actually decreases. Honing in, with once again, looking at the compound of interest, opener O, the condition where 2 millimolar is present, it is within the range of expectation of manual patch clamp. So, in this Bivera experiment, we're aiming to basically confirm the sweet spot where we have the maximum signal to background and EC50 values that were similar to manual patch clamp. We had three different concentrations of thallium, one, two, and three, and three different concentrations of potassium, 0, 1.25, and 2.5. And once again, what we saw was signal to background was best when there was two millimolar of thallium and no potassium present, shown again in green. And once again, we also saw that when you increase potassium, 
concentrations, you see the depression in that signal in the background. Moreover, you see the EC50 is most similar to manual patch clamp when you have two millimolar stallion once again and no potassium. So at this point, we're ready to look at some reference compounds that were, that were commercially available. Uh, in this slide, I show results for two of those uh, reference compounds, both of them being potassium channel openers. Once again, opener O and opener P. Set up similar in terms of the experiment, varying concentrations of potassium. And what you see once again is what we saw previously, in that you have the best thing of the background at two and zero, and as you increase the potassium, you see again the depression of signal in the background. More importantly, in both of these uh, cases, as well as another opener, we saw that their EC50s were comparable to the manual patch clamp values. With opener O, the experiment here shows a result of essentially 11, 9, and 11 again. We also tested another compound with the same therapeutic indication, but working by a different mechanism. It didn't work by opening the potassium channel, and we saw essentially no effect. What you saw was essentially for all concentrations something similar to this red line here. We also looked at two potassium channel closers, and it as well showed no EC50 values. So at this point, we, were, we had an assay that we felt uh, that was, we felt we were very comfortable with to move forward. But at this point. Molecular devices actually came to me and had their beta test uh, kit ready to evaluate. I'm going to spend a little time talking about this. The key difference of this uh, kit is that it's a no wash kit, which means it has ex an extracellular masking dye to quench fluorescence when your dye actually reacts with the thallium. So, in effect, all you're able to measure what is the fluorescence generated in the cytoplasm. So this is data comparing the two different kits. Right off the bat, as I mentioned before, the, the quencher basically allows you to remove this washing step. And that simplifies assay prosecution. Certainly within our HTS format, it uh, made some of the logistics much simpler and prosecution, again, uh, quicker. The other thing you'll notice is that there's an improved signal to background. With the thallium wash assay kit, you see you get about a two-fold here. Whereas in the Medoka devices kit, you actually see something very close to threefold. I should also point out that I actually did no optimization on this molecular devices kit because I didn't have enough uh, beta reagents to, to do this. All I did was I took the reagents that they gave me and implemented in the optimized assay conditions that I established for the wash assay. In addition to easier prosecution and improved signal to background, we saw also reduced well-to-well -well variation, as shown here by some of these error bars. But more importantly, we saw that the same compounds are active in both thallium flux assays. When you look at the active compounds B, G, I, M, O, and P, the O and P are the same compounds that we tested previously, we see that the EC50 results are very comparable. And more importantly, both assays were uh, comparable to the manual patch plan. But given the other, all the other things that we said, the simpl simpl simplicity and the improved signal of the background and the reduced well to well variation, we decided to, that the molecular devices kit actually had better performance. And we moved forward with that with our HTS. And we had some interesting data uh, from that as well. Unfortunately, the uh, program for that ended, and uh, I don't have uh, much more data on that to show you. So in conclusion, both flipper thallium flux assay kits provided a functional measurements of the potassium channel openers. Certainly, both were within threefold of manual patch clamp data. Um, but again, we decided to go forward with the molecular devices wash kit because of the simplification of the protocol and assay prosecution. And it saved time and potential points of error. The molecular devices no wash kit also improved assay performance it in by increasing our signal to background, reducing well to well variation, and improving data quality overall.
I want to take this time to acknowledge uh, the people involved in this um, project. First, two from from Qubit, Hao Chen and Jan, who were uh, the project leads in this project. Uh, Keith Russell, who is the electrophysiologist assigned to the project. His manager, Jeff, who was insightful in his knowledge and experience with dealing with and working with ion channels. My manager, Deb, and Rory Curtis, my director, for supporting us in our project and uh, making sure that we had everything in place to uh, prosecute. Kristen, who was also involved in, who was involved immensely through her expertise with the Slipper Tetra, and Tom for his, also for his electrophysiology and uh, cell biology experience. I want to acknowledge some people from Molecular Devices as well. Catherine Parrish, who was the first person to contact me uh, with this data test. Uh, she was instrumental because she's always uh, involved in keeping, in keeping up to date with our project needs and our reagent needs. Evan, who contacted us and sort of uh, made sure that we had uh, pre-release of the, pro the actual kit, all the regions that we needed to actually prosecute our HDX. His team uh, worked very diligently to make sure that we got that stuff ahead of schedule. Yen Wen, who worked with me on some of the slides and for the poster. And Shin, for setting up this webinar. Thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to your questions.